And I'm going to turn it over to Erica, another one of our board members. She's going to give us some announcements. And then Claire and Peter will be leading us in our discussion today. So, Erica? Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to the October uh, Midday Cafe for the Great Lakes region. We're always glad to have you guys and want to let you know about a few upcoming opportunities, places you can plug in. Um, two of them are very soon. And so um, next week, uh, Scott and Claire Lowridge are hosting an I Enneagram Motions of the Soul certification in historic Marshall, Michigan. And yes, there is still room. So I'm going to post a link for that training. But if you are looking for certification and to become a practitioner that uses the Enneagram, um, we'd love for you to check out that opportunity. It's an amazing training, both personally and then just to learn even about this work that Claire has done with harmony and motions of the soul. And it's all encompassed in their book, Two Spiritual Rhythms for the Enneagram. So just a plug for that as well. <laughs> um, but we'll drop that link in the chat. The other thing we want to let you know about, uh, Teresa McCloy that just said hello at the beginning of the call, and I both uh, work with Enneagram, real life Enneagram circles. And so Teresa is the CEO of the business, um, the real life process. And we've been to Claire's training many times and people often ask us, so I've done my certification, now how do I use this in the real work that I do? And so we love helping people apply the tool of the Enneagram in your real work. So we've got spiritual directors, coaches, um, pastors, um, all different kinds of people using uh, the tool of the Enneagram in their work. So we'd love for you to check out um, Collaborative Enneagram Circles. It's a way for you to be in community and have some done for you resources. If you're like, I don't even know where to start, but I wanna start using this tool in my work. So I'll drop that in. Circles are open until this Saturday. That's the last time they'll be open um, this year and then we'll reopen them again next year in 2020. And then finally, um, we are excited to be partnering with the Minnesota chapter next summer, July 24th and 25th to host a regional conference in Chicago. And so we've just opened the call for presenters. So if you're an IEA professional member, or as Claire said, there are opportunities for you to become a professional member and you want to present or do a workshop, we would love to have you apply. And we've got a blind committee that's gonna be looking at those applications. So all three of those links will be in the chat for you um, to take advantage of and, and look at how you could uh, plug in a little deeper. So. I'm gonna turn it over now to Claire Lowridge, our IEA GLR president. Well, thanks, Erica. And um, we're really grateful that you all are on the call today with Peter O'Hanrahan. And the, you know, the gift of Peter uh, to the IEA community for 40 years, he was one of the first people to learn the Enneagram at Berkeley. And so when we think about his work with the Enneagram Worldwide and Enneagram Professional Training Program, he's worked alongside Dr. David Daniels and Helen Palmer for the past 20 years to help certify and train people. In fact, over 800 people already have gotten their certification with Peter. And so it's really an honor for you to be here. We, um, the Great Lakes region uh, had you here just a couple of years ago with, with Ginger. And we experienced um, the lovely two and eight dynamic duo uh, bringing us that, that holistic Enneagram experience, um, engaging all three centers of intelligence. And that really is one of the things with Peter that you should know. Um, you know, also he's been a, a counselor and a body therapist. So he's very uh, much um, a, a guru, if you will, great master teacher in the holistic Enneagram. And so um, I love that Peter's here. I wanna take a breath for a moment and just be grateful for all of the people that are on this call, that all of us here have come because we are seeking to live in a way that brings our best presence to the world. Uh, you're taking a moment at your lunchtime to say, how can I be centered? How can I be living from that place in myself that is most true? So just feel the goodness of your own body for a moment and just notice what it's like to be you today. And 
as you're breathing, see if you can't open up to even a little more of who you truly are as we listen to Peter on this day. And maybe we can even begin by just, if you feel so inclined, just nodding your head and saying thank you to Peter for being here with us. Yeah. Peter, we, um, we know that you've worked with the nine character structures based on the three centers. And with the holistic Enneagram and the good work that you're doing, um, we're just, maybe we could even open up with the habits of mind and how they serve us or how we get stuck. Maybe we could move from head to heart to gut. Don't, don't know how you'd like to proceed, but we are open to your presentation. Well, thanks, Claire, and everybody for being here. Um, it's nice to see you all. <clears throat> well, you know, the Enneagram is just wonderful. We understand that people are uh, wonderful themselves, and people are also difficult. And uh, it's great to have the Enneagram to, to kind of be able to hold that and, and work with that in ourselves and in our relationships. And, um, you know, my interest from the very beginning was, in part, that the Enneagram is a holistic system. And it talks about people in three centers of intelligence. And I, you all are familiar with that, of course. But um, to understand how the type structures are based in all three centers. And, of course, we, we generally start with um, uh, looking at or, or being aware of our patterns of, of thinking, our habit of mind. Because we know the Enneagram says, okay, so every, every one of the nine types has a particular focus of attention. And uh, it's part of our pattern, and we need our patterns in order to organize information about the world and organize our own behaviors. Um, and so I, I want to value the, um, the types and, and the patterns that we have, as well as um, kind of talk about them in terms of how we can work with them, how we can develop them, because as we know, we, we can get stuck. Mm. You know, the original uh, term, the original words for the Enneagram back in the day, the types were known by their fixations. You know, so there was ego resent for one, and ego flattery for two, and ego go for three, and ego melancholy for four. And of course, at some point we wanted to, you know, kind of move on from those descriptions because they weren't really friendly enough. But there is something there around how our habit of mind gets fixated. And um, how we, we get kind of stuck in our particular point of view. So. Um, so yeah, we could start by talking a little bit about the habits of attention. Um, I guess I could put something up on the screen here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We'd love that. Something to look at besides, besides us. Let's see. If I can share this guy here. Okay. And let's get that in the slideshow. Okay, so is that coming through? All right. So, um, so here's just a little diagram of the three centers. And, um, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff talked about people as three brain beings, which is always funny language, you know, three brain beings, because he talked about the three brains in terms of these centers. And it's, it's interesting to me that now, many years later, 100 years later, that uh, scientists are talking about actual brain cells in the lining around the heart and brain cells in the gut. And um, you know, maybe his, his comment about three brains was more accurate than, than we knew. But um, three centers of intelligence, and we all have all three, and the type structure is based on all three. So it's not just the way we think. But let's take a look at the habits of attention. Um, which are very closely associated to the goals of the nine types. I think that's also interesting. I don't have that chart, but it's, it's pretty close to this. Meaning that for all of us, we have a central goal. Um, so for nine, that would be harmony, and for uh, getting along with people, and for two, uh, excuse me, one, it's about um, you know being a good person and doing the right thing, and for twos, it's the emphasis on being connected in relationships and so on. And... Um, and one of those is a priority for us. So um, 
even though we may be interested in a lot of the goals, we share things with other people around the Enneagram, it's still one of those is really the priority. You know, I'm interested in harmony. I like harmony, but I have to confess that as a type eight, it's not my number one goal. Or, you know, being a good person or doing the right thing. Well, that's on my list, but it's not my number one goal, which would be more about fairness and empowerment. So the habits of attention follow these kind of primary goals. And um, I know that everybody here is familiar with them, but again, one of the great and fun things about the Enneagram is we can put them on a chart, you know, and uh, you know, we've got the kind of the range of human experience, at least in terms of this particular view. Um, Claire, anything you want to say here or shall I just keep going? Well, you can keep going, but I do love, you know, you're bringing out the, the neural cells in the heart, right? And in the gut and the, and the beauty of um, this three brain idea. And now we actually have the science to back up what was uh, always known. Um, it's certainly an ancient wisdom. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm interested even with this, biological temperament and somatic patterns for each type. And I don't know that you're going to go there right away, but I, I certainly um, love the idea that there is a biological temperament that you talk about and somatic patterns and practices for each type. So I don't know if this would be a good time to do that, but. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me keep going and we'll get to the body center. Um, just a quick view of the habits of emotion and then the corresponding virtues. And I wanna make the point here that um, I think the language, uh, I've been interested in updating the language to be more, what I think is more current and, and perhaps more accurate. You know, these habits of emo or the passions, we used to say the nine passions of the heart. Um, but uh, passions, of course, can be understood in different ways. And uh, sometimes people say, well, my passion, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> well. Hinnigram used to say the passions of the heart representing contractions um, of the heart center. And as we know, these have a long history in the Christian tradition. And, uh, and I want to respect that tradition because there's just so much great information um, and wisdom uh, in the spiritual traditions of the world. Um, but I think in terms of when we talk about habits of emotion, I'm interested in, so how do we actually feel it? If we can feel it inside of ourselves, then we can pay attention, we can do something about it. And I'll use the example of type nine, because you know traditionally the word for that in the Enneagram was sloth. And every time we taught classes, you know, in the early days, we'd say, oh yes, well, nines have the, the passion of sloth. And, and then we'd have to kind of like backtrack. It's like, well, it's not really that they're lazy all the time, and it's, it, they can be very productive, and sloth is, doesn't really say it. And, and it was just kind of an awkward word. And so, um, trying to get from, in my experience of working with type nines, what is the actual feeling inside? And what I understand, and, and you may have a different view on this, but my understanding is that it's a kind of a stubbornness, an unwillingness. You know, we say eights, nines, and ones are part of the, the body group, which is also characterized by a layer of anger inside the type, type structure. And, um, and so this is, I think, how nines might experience that kind of being against the way things are with a kind of stubbornness. I mean, certainly nines can get angry at times. That's, that's no surprise. But the kind of unwillingness, the feeling of unwillingness. I don't want to do what I don't want to do, or I don't want to pay attention to what I don't want to pay attention to. And you can't make me. <laughs> so, if you're in a relationship with a type nine, this may sound familiar. Yes. <laughs> My husband, he would say that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to make that point. I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. But um, it, it's also true with type four, by the way, that I think envy, it, it, that was the traditional word for the passion of type four. But a lot of fours say, you know, envy, yeah, sometimes I, I experience envy, but it's kind of part of a larger category we could say kind of the longing, the emotion, the emotional habit is longing for what's missing. So um, anyway, so making some changes or updates in how we talk about the, uh, in this case, the habits of emotions. Mm -hmm. 
Um, one of the things we know about um, kids, because most of us, many of us are parents these days, and, you know, we, when we were young, we used to think, well, you know, our, our Enneagram type was formed in our experience in childhood, and we were operating in the context of, we would say, kind of a psychoanalytic psychology. And we could point back and say, well, this happened to me in childhood, and that's why I became my type. And of course, there was a connection there. But as we got older and started having children, we realized, kind of surprising to me, uh, that the kids show up with a certain something already there. There's a temperament. There's also other qualities, too, like, you know, certain quality of essence and spirit. But, but in terms of the body temperament, um, there's a lot of um, our, it's, it's be, we can't say it's a personality type yet because that doesn't really form until later in life, you know, five years old, six years old. But the kids show up with a certain quality of energy and a certain temperament. Mm -hmm. and, um, and here's a chart that describes that. And, and this is loosely related to um, a study that was done, you know, many years ago by a couple of uh, psychologists and, yeah, and maybe familiar with it. We're, we're not seeing your chart. Uh -huh. Here I am talking about the chart and you're not seeing yeah, it. No problem. Okay. Well. We see the type four romantic at the top here. Head uh, center, heart center, body center. Okay. Yeah. I think you'll have to stop sharing, Peter, and then reshare. Okay, stop share. Mm -hmm. And and then reshare to that new chart, and I think you'll be great. Okay, screen sharing has has failed to start. Try again later. Well, <laughs> we don't have much later here. Yeah, maybe maybe it's later enough. Ready? Let's all send our hopes for this. <laughs> To the romantic. Any any luck? We're seeing the um, the four romantic. Maybe if you could go to presenter, um, you could go to the way that you're showing this. And um, interesting. Okay. Presenter view. What if do you? You have to choose the new screen. Like on your when you go to share, it'll put a green box, you know, ah, around right. whatever you want to show. Right. So you might try it one more time and see. There it is, Sick okay. from the body, the defenses. Okay, so we're on temperaments here. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is loosely related to a study that was done by psychologists some, you know, a couple of decades ago. who were looking at um, what could they measure in children that was present at birth and then was consistent through their first few years, irregardless of their uh, early environment. In other words, they try to measure temperament. And they actually came up with nine different measurable temperaments, which, of course, we can place on the Enneagram very, very well. In any event, there's more, more work to do here, but, but we know that the types are based in neurobiology now. And we understand this from observing ourselves over time and more and more people adding into this kind of shared body of knowledge. And we also know from, you know, working with our kids, you know, and kind of how they sh showed up at the beginning. And, and then later on, we go, oh, that personality type, that could kind of sense some of those elements back when they were little kids. So, Peter, um, my, our youngest grandson turned one in August, and he had the little cake in front of him. And he, I, I have said almost from the beginning, I think he's a five. And so at this one-year-old birthday party, he took his finger. First of all, he just studied the cake. Then he took his finger and he touched it. And then he brought his finger up and he was looking at the frosting from all sides. I mean, it was just fascinating. And I thought about the ways, you know, I've watched one-year-old birthday parties. Think about it in your own experience, everybody. Like, how did the kid approach the cake? And, uh, and that, so really interesting. Um, yeah. That's great. From very early on. Right. Yeah. yeah. And of course, kids will have so many different ways of approaching the cake, you know. 
Uh, maybe that could be an early Enneagram test. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I wouldn't say that seriously, but, but it is interesting to see how the kids approach the cake and other situations, mm -hmm. depending on their basic temperament. And, um, anyway, um, <clears throat> how is this useful to us? Well, it, I mean, to understand it's, it's neurobiological, um, I mean, I, I, I'm convinced that, that my wife, Pat, and I, we didn't make our kids into those types, okay? They showed up with something already there. And that's reassuring to, to us as parents, you know? It's like, yeah, we have a lot to do with, are they well attached, well loved, and, you know, supported and, and seen and so on. But it is kind of a relief to know that, you know, we didn't make them into those particular types. Um, they show up with a lot of it in place. Mm -hmm. um, like your grandchild, Claire. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so that's one thing. And then also to understand in turn, when we're working with ourselves, um, that we can, that one of the ways, one of the things that can help us is to, again, working with awareness, our inner observer, kind of noticing the type pattern on the inside, because that's the whole, that's the big key, as you know, to working with the Enneagram. It's, it's one thing to learn about the nine types, which is wonderful, but to actually put it to work, we have to kind of go inside and begin to notice the type patterns on the inside. And, and the three centers is a wonderful, shows us is like, kind of helps us organize the territory, the inner territory, and understand, you know, our thoughts and our feelings and also what's happening in our body. I think that, uh, you know, as a, again, as a background in body therapy, um, you know, working with the Enneagram with clients for so many years, um, uh, it, it seemed to me that people had a different, not only different temperaments, but also that we could notice different signals from our body. And here's a chart of the, of the signals. And, um, you know, they're not rigid categories. Uh, maybe we move around a little bit as we do on the Enneagram at times. But if we understand that there's a, there is a basic neurobiology and that results in certain patterns of response, and activity in our bodies, we can notice when that shows up and, um, and pause. You know, use that mindfulness practice of pause, breathe, and see what we wanna do. And sometimes we can mediate our response or we can, or sometimes just in the pause, that, that helps. So, um, and of course, yes. Yeah, can you go around the circle with this? Yeah, and maybe sure. Back that a little? So we'll start with one, you know, there's this pressure that comes on for type ones. And, you know, we talk about the, um, the patterns of holding in the body, uh, what has been called oftentimes in the, in the somatic work, uh, body armoring. And there's different patterns around the Enneagram, and I'll try to mention those. But for ones, is that, that the response, that, that pressure, that kind of tightening up that can happen for type one, when they feel a need to be to do the right thing and to get it right. And I think if ones can notice that pressure, that, that there's actually a signal there from the body, um, if you can pause and breathe, that that can open up a lot more room for uh, kind of working with that response. I don't want to make it wrong. It's not about right and wrong, good and bad um, for all of us, let alone type ones. But just to be able to notice so that we're not, again, the problem with the patterns is they get automatic. And so if ones are, um, can notice that kind of pressure that comes on, and sometimes it happens in the jaw, you know, ones talk about holding tension in the jaw, neck, and shoulders. That's, these are common areas for, for ones to hold tension. Uh, that there's a way to, at times perhaps, take some breaths and kind of mediate that response. Relax a little bit. Um, it's not always possible to relax. Sometimes we notice the response. We're not able to relax it, but at least we can notice and, you know, respond, you know, do what, do take care of ourselves in some way. You know, we can, we can do something or ask for support or engage in one of our practices. Um, for twos, it's like this pull towards others. I've heard so many twos say, you know, I'm around, whenever I'm around other people, I feel pulled towards them, 
literally an energetic pull coming from the area of the heart and the chest. It's, you know, kind of making that connection. Mm -hmm. And perhaps sometimes there's a different kind of pressure there. Um, but, um, you know, to say, you know, I can just notice if I practice being, when I'm with people, instead of all my attention going out towards them, if I retain, reserve some of my attention to the inside, I can notice that pull that it takes me out of myself. At the, if it's too much, again, it's not good or bad, but if it's too much, then I'm over there, you know, kind of empathizing with them and feeling what they're feeling and what they're needing, and I've somehow lost contact with myself. And so that upward movement, up and out movement of energy, and of course, twos, if they can notice this and pause and breathe, can work on bringing attention and energy back to, and breath, really, back to the lower body. Uh, good practice for twos, uh, and not just twos, but especially for twos, is to feel your feet on the floor. You know, feel your feet on the floor, your body, your breath. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I know that many, many twos, you know, that that is an important practice. Can I feel my breath inside my body while I'm being with people and at the same time experiencing that pull towards making the connection? Mm -hmm. and threes, it's pretty clear, you know, threes, basic temperament, I mean, their neurobiology is, it's a combination of being sensitive to other people's expectations, you know, like twos, you know. Uh, but with threes, it's like the, this like energy that wants to move and make things happen. And it's just an, it, <laughs> yeah, this is a strong energy to come forward and be active in the world. And so threes can learn how to notice this rush of momentum, this rush of moving forward. Um, and there can be some pressure associated with this also, you know, the pressure, the need to perform and earn recognition in the eyes of others. But, but just on the body level. When, that, when you can tune into that kind of forward rush, um, which you know, can be wonderful, but if it's automatic and habitual, can also be too much. So for threes to take a moment even and pause and take a breath and, and you know, open up some, some choice. You know, we've practiced this enough, we get to make some choice. Do I wanna move forward or do I wanna move forward Quickly, do I want to alter my pace? Do I want to wait a little bit? It opens up a whole range of possibility for type three if they're not being, you know, controlled by that energetic forward rush that is so uh, familiar to them. Four is say the wave of longing or disappointment. I'm sure there's more to it. You know, I, again, I don't want to talk about this in a limiting way. It's just a, a starting point for exploration. But fours often report that there's just this kind of wave of emotion, one of the many waves of emotion, perhaps. But when the wave of disappointment comes through, uh, through their body and that kind of tendency to withdraw, that kind of backing away that happens, that if you can pause, breathe, and notice, there's the possibility of, working with that. Um, and for fives, even more clearly, that urge to withdraw, that sudden urge to get out of there, you know, to move away. And um, which maybe that's true and you want to follow that movement away, or maybe you want to say, wait a minute, can I stay here a little bit longer, um, breathe more deeply, um, get more in contact with my body, and, and so on. It, does, it opens up the possibilities for a different response than simply going with the, um, the tendency. <clears throat> Sixes, you know, um, neurobiologically, they have the most sensitive alarm system of all the types. You know, they, we all have an alarm system, you know, that, that, that alerts us to danger or potential threat. And then we respond with a kind of a, a, a freeze flight or fight response. But for sixes, that's the most sensitive and the most easily triggered of all the types. And, um, and it has huge uh, 
survival value, protective value for not only the individual, but for the family and the tribe and the group and, you know, and, you know, huge con uh, contributions that sixes have made to our safety and security over the course of human history. Um, but for an individual person who's a type six, in the modern world, that alarm system can get triggered so quickly and so yeah. frequently that it's hard to actually relax and, uh, you know, sets, sets up a response. Um, so being able to notice that and respond to that, you know, with breath, breathing technique or, or movement or exercise or self-talk or whatever, whatever you've got um, can interrupt or at least hold and contain sometimes this, this alarmed response. It's very hard to get to the, to the base of the type structure in type six, any of the types really, without being able to understand the, mm -hmm. the body responses. And, uh, you know, it's like saying to type six, well, you know, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Well, <laughs> one, you don't say that to sixes. Uh, That's not a good idea. And two, it's just not kind because it's not respecting what's happening in their bodies. Mm. You know, don't worry, it'll all be, that's somebody else. That's somebody else's, uh, uh, you know, somatic experience. Sevens, you know, it, it's just the, the flight up and out. You know, it's just that this energy comes up up and out and into this wonderful space full of unlimited possibilities and uh and uh sometimes it's it can be used as kind of an escape you know from limitation but sevens you know neurobiologically they just have this tremendous capacity for stimulation and like any of the strengths of the types if you overuse it if you overdo it it's going to lead to problems so to, for sevens to be able to notice when that, that there's that energetic response of moving away from in and down to up and out, uh, it's just a great reminder to say, okay, what's happening? And, you know, can I breathe myself back down? Is that something I want to do? Uh, is there something going on that I'm trying to, you know, get away from? Or maybe it's just my, my um, positive outlook that's taking me up into the, you know, the great space of, of plans and possibilities and pleasures. Now, type eight, you know, as I, you know, I'm familiar with this as a type eight, it's just this, this kind of powering up and you know, like get bigger, stronger, tougher. And it, and it happens not only in particular critical situations where we can actually kind of notice like, okay, I'm getting all, you know, I'm getting big now because I, I'm engaging in some kind of, opposition or conflict with an obstacle or another person uh, that certainly gets our intent attention but just in smaller ways just sometimes walking around sometimes I you know walking down the street or walking into a room you know I catch myself kind of powering up like I'm gonna get bigger here because and and th now that's a habit and that's a habit sometimes I don't need and sometimes it's a habit that gets in my way because if I'm getting all kind of big and strong um, that may get in the way of my uh, connection with other people, mm. connection with the external environment. I don't want to be walking around all the time being all powered up. I want to be able to manage that energetically. Mm -hmm. And for nines, you know, that to, to be able to notice that when that pull to relax effort comes, you know, it's like when the body says, you know, oh, well, we'll just go over here or we'll do something a little bit that's not quite the main priority because that'll be easier or I'll just, I won't speak up because it's not that important and it's easier not to. And, and of course, we talk about all this in terms of the patterns of the mind and the patterns of the heart, but it's also paralleled and I think supported uh, by the neurobiology in the body. And nines, by the way, you know, there's just this lovely quality of blending, you know, that nines are able to blend and blend with people and blend with the environment and blend with computers. You know, I mean, it's just this kind of blending quality. Um, their boundary system is different from many of the rest of us. And that's just how they show up. And 
in, in the modern world where everybody's supposed to have kind of a you know a developed ego to be an individual uh it's more challenging for nines uh, because they have to work on creating boundaries and uh, watch the blending because sometimes the blending can take them away from you know where they are or what they need to do or what their priorities are yeah. So anyway, but my point here is just if we can notice that there are signals from the body, I think that can be a big help and a reminder to say, okay, let me pause and breathe and take a moment to pay attention here. Well, it's beautiful. And, and your language choice, I just find fabulous. Um, so one's pressure, two's pull toward, three, rush forward for wave of longing yeah i mean just all the way around the choice of words um i don't know you know if we let's all give it a snap and say that is awesome <laughs> you know and when i think of um I, and i we won't go here but when i think of harmony triads and i'm looking at those three energies within the one four seven two five eight three six nine you just have beautiful access to relax and you know and try another energy and uh, so it's beautiful. Thank you, Peter. Love it. I wonder if there are questions from around the, uh, from around the circle here that you'd like to ask Peter um, about this. Or, and if not, we'll, we'll move on to something else. Is there a hand? Teresa. Peter, you know, playing off of what Claire just said from the harmony. So... Uh, in those body signals that were given, what would be your, uh, where would you want to take someone or invite them to outside of their type, say for a type nine, um, you know, where would you invite them to go? What would you, what other energy, so to speak, or what else could they notice? What are some of your thoughts there? Well, there's, there's a lot of ways to to look at this. I mean, that's, the Enneagram is so rich in this regard. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think what would be something useful today. I mean, um, you know, uh, to me, the 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 a key method is working with breath. If we say pause and breathe is the key method. We know the Enneagram doesn't come with methodology or ideology, which is the reason why it can be used in so many different ways by people around the world in so many different situations, because you combine it with a method. Um, so to me, the basic method, I mean, again, the, the paying attention, self-awareness, pausing, and then I think that working with the breath, we can actually change our internal state to some degree, if that's appropriate. Now, there's receptive practice and active practice in, in many different ways. But in terms of the breath, receptive practice is simply following the breath. You know, that's, that's, that's the basic practice. We do a lot of that in the narrative Enneagram school and probably other people do if you've had exposure to certain meditation um, approaches or schools, you know, it's just following the breath. It's a neutral object and there's a lot of value in that. Um, on the other side, there's, there's active breathing. Right? So active breathing, breathing means we're actually directing the breath. And to me, there's a, there's a lot to say here about how each of the nine types can uh, work with the breath to mediate and handle their natural pattern, the pattern of their type. So for example, with nines, um, it's, uh, you know, and this is kind of a, it's kind of a secret hiding in plain sight. Nines are actually good at breathing into the belly. Well, breathing into the belly is the calming breath. And, and that's great that nines can access calm, but can nines breathe up into the chest? Cause that's the charging breath. Right. And so what I notice in nines is like, well, they'll breathe up into their chest as, as much as they need to accomplish something, whether that's like doing the dishes or, you know, uh, running a race. I mean, they they can do that, but in regular life, they tend to not breathe so much into the chest because it's more comfortable to stay more towards the calm uh, energy. 
but then they don't have access to, to, the, to, to the full capacity. And so nines will say sometimes like, yeah, I just don't have the energy for that. Well, you know what? If you breathe into your chest more, you'll have more energy. So, uh, but like the contrast we say between nine and three, like threes are really good at breathing into the chest. <laughs> yes, That's we like to breathe in the chest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> uh, and let's make things happen and let's come forward. And as I, but, but to breathe down into the belly, that's the challenge for threes. It's because of the, the breath for twos and threes is that it tends to kind of go as far down as the diaphragm and then not a lot of further. And so, um, so for, for some types, breathing down into the belly is really a great way to balance out the, the type structure. Mm -hmm. So anyway, am I speaking to your question? No, that's great. I, you know, I, I don't want to stop you there, but I love this idea of where we breathe into and, you know, how each type breathes into a different place. That was, yeah, yeah. some gold. There's an article if you're interested on my website, so I don't have to go through it all right now. Okay. We'll reference that article. We'll find it and reference yeah. that. So thank you for that. That was, I love it. That was awesome. Yeah. So I wonder if there is an active breath and a, uh, did you call it inactive breath? If there isn't also a um, mindful breath that when you invite people to breathe from the bottom of their feet up to the top of the head and do a bit of a body scan, if that isn't then activating some of the, um, you know, the neural cells here, uh, uh, you know, this, this active breath in the chest region, this inactive breath in the belly. Did you say inactive? Uh, well, I said receptive. receptive. But I think what you're saying is, yes, that, that would be on the active side because you're, you're directing attention and breath throughout your body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the active breathing practice, practices, however we want to combine them, we can combine them with Tai Chi or yoga or visualization, you know. Um, I'm just calling them active because I think it's also important that we balance the active stuff with some receptive breathing too, where we just kind of like be there with our breath. Mm -hmm. um, both are good. Nice. Any other questions around the circle here? Come on, don't be shy. You've got Peter O'Hanrahan. You're going to want to ask him something. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah. Well, and what do you think, Peter? Would you want to talk about the defense systems and the lead center? I'll say something briefly about that. Let me get back to my screen share here. Um, Let's see. Um, I'm making the most of my 50 minutes here. So, <laughs> so you're not getting my screen share yet, right? Not yet. Okay. Let's, um, let me come back and uh, go to share and okay. How about now? Yes. All right, let me put that in a slideshow. So, um, I, you know, I'm always uh, excited about talking about defenses because there's such a, uh, a wonderful way into working with the type structure. I mean, there's lots of ways, but the defenses are oftentimes the problematic aspect of the type structure, meaning that the defenses keep us from knowing who we are at an essential level or knowing how we feel sometimes or, you know, it separate us from ourselves, but they also can separate us from other people or separate us from, you know, the divine. And, um, and they're very specific, which is great. And so, you know, again, we can use any of the defenses, but one of one set of defenses is particularly fits for our type. The, uh, the defenses actually use appropriate the energy of the lead center which I find fascinating because, you know, and why wouldn't they? If you were gonna de defend yourself, you're gonna use what you got, where you're strong. And so there's head-based defenses and feeling-based defenses and body-based defenses. 
And and by the way, I think we need some defenses in this life. I'm yeah. I'm again, there's a there's a there's a positive function for the defenses. Some people would say just having a type structure at all is a defense. Uh, kind of by definition. So but anyway, so the, these defenses, there's three parts to them. And um, there's an idealization, like something that's inherent in us, something that's positive in us. But when we put it in the place of the idealization, it becomes a trap. Right now we got to be like that. And then we use that idealization to ward off what's called the avoidance. Right? So, um, you know, let me use an example, um, say seven, you know, sevens are wonderfully positive, And yes, there is some kind of neurobiological base for this. Um, and there's stories about that. But, but they genuinely do have a lot of this positive energy um, in their bodies and in their spirits. And, and yet when they put that in the place of the idealization, then they get stuck. I have to be positive. That, that's who I am. That's, that's what makes life worth living. That's what makes me a worthwhile human being. And I can use that being positive to avoid pain. And so there's a dichotomy there that opens up. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third element called the defense mechanism, which is in type seven is the, called rationalization. And again, we can all rationalize, explain things away, which we don't want to feel or take responsibility for. Anybody can rationalize, but mm -hmm. sevens are better at it <laughs> because <laughs> their minds are so quick and you know facile and you know so they can rely on rationalization um so that's a very brief uh description of those three aspects it's beautiful and um and would you uh guide us in maybe in a um in a meditation here with all three centers sure. that should be all right and and before we do that what i'd like to say is um peter has a uh, a Tuesday class coming up. Can you tell folks what that is? Because I'd like to end with your meditation. Okay. Uh, tell us about what's coming. Well, just if if people may be interested, I'm doing a, a four week series. Uh, it starts on, uh, I think, let's see, it's uh, uh, actually Wednesday, starting, is that right? Wednesday, October 30th, and it's going to be at 4.30 Pacific, which is 6.30 Central couple of hours and the title is the holistic enneagram so four classes starting october 30th and again this is this is on my website the enneagram at work.com and there's also some articles about what i've been talking about today so if you're interested you know just go to the menu where it says articles beautiful any anything else that you want us to know where you're going to be in uh, you know in the coming months that or would you like us just to go and mess around on your website? <laughs> uh, well, you know my main uh, activity is with the Narrative Enneagram School, you know Palmer Daniels Training Program, and and so um, that's happening. Uh, you know, in California, we do it in February and August, and we do it in other places too. And um, of course, what's fascinating is to see how, how much interest there is in the Enneagram these days. I think you're, you are all are aware of this, but as someone from way back at the beginning, we had no idea that it would become this popular. Um, and look what's happening now. You know, it's 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 in the it's having an expansion in the Christian churches. It's expanding in in companies and organizations and then there's this phenomenon on the internet so uh trying to just kind of keep up with all that and and it's like so how do how do i as a teacher and how do we as a enneagram school you know kind of respond and meet that in some way of providing service and and i and i appreciate what you all are doing too you know claire and, and others here who are who are teaching and doing training programs and because there's a lot a lot we can <laughs> a lot we need to do to meet this surge of interest yeah and i i really appreciate it you and i had a conversation yesterday about this and i just was asked to write an article for formatio uh, magazine and i opened up with the idea that some of the teachers who've been teaching for longer than a decade or two or three or four like yourself um, are having some conflict around 
how the Enneagram is uh, on the rise and who's teaching it and are they, should they be teaching it and do I like memes? Or are those memes really putting us in these boxes? And do we like all of the stereotyping and all of that? And the narrative tradition is better because we want to hear story. And, you know, anyway, and I loved your humility yesterday. And, and it is what we wrote about in this article to say, how about we just say this is a gateway for a new generation and that we can introduce them to folks that have been teaching for a long time, like yourself, to say, and when you get through the gate with a meme, here are some places you could study that could help deepen that work. So there, everything belongs, as Richard Rohr would say. And, uh, and, and I loved your graciousness and your humility in saying that um, as a person who's been teaching for four decades, that you aren't pushing back on the beauty of this moment, but you're receptive and you're also available. Well, Beautifully said, Claire. Yeah. It's something we share. So if you would guide us in a meditation to close. Sure. And then at the end, everyone, um, you feel free to exit. Okay. So just, you know, 90 seconds here. So if you could take a big breath and let it out. Sometimes we say uh, one big breath kind of brings us back in and down. And follow the breath, the sensation of the breath inside. So being able to bring our attention to the inside, to notice what's happening in, inside of us and the activity of our type structure opens up a door to putting the Enneagram to work. And we could look at our three centers briefly, and you could notice something about the activity of your mind, the pacing of your thoughts, where your attention wants to go. And as we notice this, we observe the activity of our mind, we're not completely identified with it. Some part of our awareness is observing. We're not completely involved. There's a little bit of objectivity that develops. And if you can bring your attention to your heart center in a similar way, to notice something about how you're feeling or or, or simply what is your mood. And for some of us, we have to stay there a little longer. We, we don't get a quick answer. Well, I don't know how I'm feeling, but it's, it's good to practice. And just for another breath or two to notice something about what's happening in our heart center. And how available we are in our heart or how reserved we might be. There's an opening and a closing. And then to follow the breath down into the belly, which is really the center of the life force itself. So maybe you can notice something, some quality of the life force. And there's a center of intelligence here too. Call it the Hara, the Dantian, the body center. And the practice begins with simply getting here. Can I get here with my attention? Follow the breath all the way down to the belly center. Notice the presence of the life force. And open the door to all of the information and experience and connection that happens through our body center. And 
Okay, thanks for joining me in the practice. We'll bring our attention back out. Wishing you well for your day.